Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week we're joined by Ariel Kagan, a strategy and innovation specialist at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Ariel and I talk about how she got into this field, the importance of agriculture to the state, and a new report on kosher meat that she helped lead into publication on this week's Who the Folk podcast. Ariel Kagan, welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you are employed at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture as a, a strategy and innovation specialist. Yes, I am. <laughs> so uh, tell us all what exactly that means, because that's a feel, especially in Minnesota, where there's a lot of uh, agriculture business, a lot of farms, feels like a very big, potentially really big job. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a vague title. It's, uh, <laughs> it, very, it is very vague. <laughs> it means I get to do a lot of interesting things. So okay. I work in our domestic marketing division. Um, so we're really thinking about how to bring value to Minnesota producers, expanding markets, finding new uh, crops, new uses, new applications, and also identifying market opportunities for Minnesota farmers. Um, so within that, we get to do... A lot of different projects. Uh, right now I'm working on a project about emerging farmers, which is all about uh, folks who maybe haven't been represented as well in Minnesota agriculture. So immigrant farmers and women and young farmers, veterans. Um, and that's a report that will also be coming out this spring for the legislature. So what does uh, what led you to, to the Minnesota Department of Agriculture? And I suppose for, because it's, you know, it's a state government, job, I think people may, I guess, let's go back a sec, people may get confused between like somebody who's a political appointee versus somebody who's more of a sort of a career staff person yes. type role. You're not a political appointee. I'm not a political. So your job, if you so choose, and I suppose if your boss so chose, could span Democratic or Republican leadership based yes. on who, regardless of who the... Uh, director of Agriculture is. Correct, okay. yeah. So I'm full-time staff there, and no matter which way the winds blow, I will have a job as, as long as that position still exists. Okay. Yep. Um, and how I ended up at MDA is the acronym for Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, I grew up here in St. Paul and moved out east and got involved uh, after college in food and ag policy, spent a lot of time in D.C. working on different issues of sustainable food systems, everything from fisheries to urban ag to um, how does sustainability fit into the dietary guidelines. Uh, and then I decided at a certain point that it was time to come home, and I moved back to Minnesota and was really lucky to find this position with MDA because I do feel very strongly about contributing to my home state and trying to make our agricultural system uh, better and more effective and uh representing Minnesotans in that position. So were, were you, had you always been like, did you go through college in some sort of either like farming or agriculture or that type of sort of train of schooling? What was the, I guess, how did you get, what, what, what was it that you know put you on that path? Yeah. Um, the joke I like to tell is that the most important thing to me in high school was Harry Potter. So I made a decision about where to go to school based on how much it looked like Hogwarts. That's obviously not exactly true. So but where I did you go to school? Ended up at Mount Holyoke College, which is a small <laughs> women's liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts. Um, unofficial motto is 2000 women in the woods. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, uh, it's a great school. It's, it's a really beautiful school and it has really wonderful professors. And um, I majored in economics okay. and I did focus a lot on agriculture. It's always been really close to my heart. Uh, growing up in Minnesota, even in the city, was really involved in food systems work. As a kid, we were really involved with these community gardens in okay. St. Paul. So uh, from a young age, I really had a deep sense that food is the best way to bring people together. And it, you know, it has all this power for community and economic development. How large an industry is agriculture in the state? It's a large part of our economy. Okay. So I think that the stats are somewhere around 20 to 25 percent of our economy is ag related. Wow. So we've got 68,000 farms in Minnesota and about 100,000, 110,000 farmers on those farms. Uh, we 
then beyond farming have a huge industry related to food and ag. So we have all these big businesses like Land O'Lakes and Cargill, mm-hmm. uh, Syngenta, other businesses that are based here, and then all of your ag providers, the farm credit banks, and your John Deere, you know, uh, shops around in, in greater Minnesota, and veterinary care. So it's this really large part of our economy. You know, it's interesting. I don't, I, until you had said it, I wouldn't necessarily have thought of something like, you know, the veterinary care or your, your John Deere tractor dealers. I, I wouldn't have thought about it as being lumped in. I, I sort of, you know, think of the just, just, not just, but the farmers and the farms and the and what is produced. I don't. I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought of the other pieces that are that are very much touch what those farmers do every day. Yeah, it's a huge section of the economy, and a lot of what we think about also when we think about farm viability is uh, most farms now have one spouse who's working off the farm. It's typically okay. a spouse. So uh, what jobs are available? And farmers may be both farming their own plot of land and also be the the John Deere uh, person in town. And they, have, they wear many hats because uh, farm incomes are not doing so well right now. Right. And so we're trying to think about how you create more opportunities and more jobs in greater Minnesota that can serve those 110,000 farmers. So, I mean, it seems like it very much ties to your economic, your schooling in economics, because it really is not just the growing and producing of food. It's, it's sort of everything that, that drives that piece of what is a very large economic engine in Minnesota. Yes. Or a large piece of Minnesota's economic engine, I should say. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was, very happy to get a degree in economics because I think it helps you see systems. Mm-hmm. And then I ended up also getting a master's degree in ag econ. And so that's how I see the world. <laughs> it's, that's my, uh, my approach to most things. Had you, when you were out East and you know, eventually in, you know, in DC, was this sort of the area that you saw yourself kind of working in either long term or certainly in this near term next stage? Yeah, I mean, I think that food and ag has always been core to my my uh, sensibilities, and working in state government was always sort of appealing to me because okay. I did have that sort of idealistic. I still do have that idealistic notion of, you know, our government is, uh, you know, we're civil servants. We serve the people. We are trying to make the world a better place. Um, in D.C., I worked outside of government trying to affect government. So we, I was in a think tank, and we wrote a lot of reports and had a lot of meetings and convenings trying to get government to do different things. So it has been a bit of a switch coming into the role of inside the, the hallowed halls, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm learning a lot about what that means. So was it a lot of lobbying then in your past job? Uh, we weren't lobbyists so much, but we, it was a lot of... Um, just convening and trying to educate and bring mm-hmm. issues together. So um, specifically around urban agriculture, how that could be supported through the farm bill, and then also on local and regional food systems and how do you measure their impacts and how does the federal government uh, lead on local and regional food. So how do you take those experience working outside government but trying to influence government with what you do now within yeah, it's. I always have to sort of remind myself that now in this position, I'm not just. Um, I, I can't just think about my own opinions. That right. I uh, am working for all Minnesotans, and that that's ultimately our boss is uh, Minnesota residents, and so it's it's a little different, but it's challenging and it's exciting because I think that we do have such a strong civic bent in Minnesota, mm-hmm. and uh, we have some really great groups in Minnesota working on farm issues, so I've been lucky to connect with a lot of those folks and and hear about what what they want us to do, right, and what needs to happen to support agriculture from their perspective and how what role Minnesota Department of Ag has in that. So you mentioned that you're, you're working on a report that will be coming out sometime in the spring for the legislative session. One report that just came out uh, last week, a few days ago, on uh, on the eighth, was 
a Minnesota meat market assessment when it comes to halal and kosher meat. You were one of the leads, the project leads on it. Uh, so from a high level, very high level takeaway on that, on that report, what, I get, I get what is the, what was your assessment in terms of the opportunities that, 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 uh, that may be there for, for Minnesota farmers? Well, it will probably not surprise any of your listeners uh, to hear the answer, which is it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did not get to a final sort of number okay. uh, in the report. And I think that that's good because I think that these markets are complicated. Yeah. Um, that's the best way to approach something is to understand its diversity and complexities and then try to figure out uh, how to wrap your head around it. So some background on the report. Um it was funded through Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute, AURI. Okay. Uh, and they put out you know, a call for proposals to do this research about halal and kosher meat. Uh, we partnered then with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships at the University of Minnesota, which is part of Extension. Okay. And they brought their whole team of amazing researchers around the state to help us to understand this question better. And we ended up with more than 25 people on the research team. Wow. Uh, which was pretty that's incredible. A great, that's a great, <laughs> great sized team. I feel yeah. like you could do a lot of deep research with that many people yes um so much expertise we had people who are veterinarians we had people who are rural development specialists people who are farmers people who are halal consumers kosher consumers so it was really uh pretty powerful to have everybody in a room and so what came out of the report um is is this great document but i think the real power of this process has been getting those groups together and starting this conversation Mm -hmm. Did you know it was a conversation that needed to be had? I didn't. Okay. Um, it was all fairly new to me. I grew up in a fairly secular Jewish household okay. and did not keep kosher. And uh, so I learned a lot through this process. Uh, it really did seem to tap a nerve. So every time we would go out and interview uh, either kosher or halal consumers and ask them, you know, what are you thinking about? What um do you are you happy with the meat that's available in the market and the price and the quality and the cuts? Uh, the answer was always a pretty lengthy response about the desire for fresh, local, sustainable, mm-hmm. um, higher quality. And um, I think there's a big opportunity there. It, it is complicated. This type of meat is um, a little bit more challenging from a processing perspective, more pr- uh, challenging in terms of keeping it in a cold chain Mm -hmm. to its final destination, wherever that may be in these small markets. Um, But it does seem like on both sides, uh, halal and kosher, there's sort of a gap in the market for a different type of offering. And and it would be just like the Jewish community to ask somebody a yes or no question and get a whole dissertation. Yes. (laughs) So I, 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 what I thought was really interesting reading through the kosher section, it was, I mean, first of all, a great callback to my uh, my day school education in, in Michigan once upon a time. But there was a lot, I mean, it was very detailed. So I think people should definitely read it, if not for um, the educational piece that I took away from it. It was a good refresher, but also um, I think just what's out there and what people think the needs are and how the state can support that. I think it's really, uh, I I think it's really interesting. Were you surprised by the responses from either the kosher or the halal? Was there anything that really uh, caught you off guard when they um, gave you you an answer to something? Yeah. I mean, I think this is true on for both of those criteria um, and certainly heard it on the kosher side is that there's a feeling you know, these markets are entirely based on trust. So mm-hmm. in economics, we call these credence attributes. They're things that you don't necessarily, you can't tell the difference by tasting it or smelling it or looking at it. You trust it because of the label or because of who sold it to you. And that's all you can do to prove that it is what you think it is. So there's this feeling that with these credence attributes, kosher and halal, um, consumers really just are sort of at the end of this long line of the supply chain, and they just have to trust that either the 
processor or the farmer or the certifying body, um, and sometimes even the retailer, are actually selling you what you think you're buying. And this is really similar to where we were in the 1990s around the organic label. Mm -hmm. People had really strong, almost religious views on what organic agriculture should be. And there were dozens, if not hundreds, of organic labels, state labels, regional labels, city labels, uh, specific, you know, farm-based labels about organic, and none of those criteria necessarily matched up. So you never, as a consumer, really knew what you were getting, and you had a hard time mm -hmm. trusting what you were buying. Um, so that sounds to me like where we are a little bit with kosher and halal, where there are a lot of different labels. Each certifying body has its own standards, and consumers just feel a little, you know, on the hook. It's like they want to do this. This is part of their faith, um, and it's really important to a lot of people. And they have no negotiation in it. They just right. have to buy it. And so I think there, where there is this big opportunity is sort of reestablishing a lot of those, uh, you know, older models of knowing your butcher, having these smaller regional markets where there's more trust and shorter supply chains. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was similar across pretty much everyone that we spoke to. Really? That's fascinating. And I think, I mean, that's gotta be a challenge only because I think people are so used to go shopping at there, you know, there is no, you know, meat, you know, just butcher shop. There are not many of those anymore. I should, I mean, there are some, but there's not a lot. I think people, you know, it, it's inefficient to go to one place for meat, to one place for, you know, vegetable. You want to go someplace where you can get everything at once. And it's, you know, I think you still have to maintain that trust in the, you know, throughout the supply chain that you're getting what they say you're getting. Yeah. <laughs> that's got, I mean, that can't, that's, you know, and I never really thought about it in that way. I just, you know, have my list. I go shopping and, or my wife goes shopping and we just get what we need and go home and tend not to think about it. Yeah. And I think a lot of people do that. And that, if that is something that works for folks, then that's great. Um, I think that they're, you know, we're seeing more and more in the millennial generation, Gen Z are looking for food in general with mm -hmm. more attributes. So um, we're seeing this with the rise of plant-based meats, right? Impossible Burger and mm -hmm. Beyond Burger. Um, and a lot of other sort of this whole movement towards regenerative agriculture. And people are looking for labels on their food uh, and they want to trust those labels. And so even though kosher and halal are pretty different uh, in terms of their background and scope mm -hmm. um, there is the similarity to just third party labeling and how do you establish trust and how do you create markets for people that are looking for specific credence attributes in their food is there a way to have sort of the the sustainability that people are looking for but also have kosher and halal is that is that a place where there's some crossover or are those sort of two different areas altogether yeah so there's there is crossover and a lot of people uh who look for halal or kosher food may think that there are these sustainability aspects to how the animal was raised and um and then how the meat is then processed and treated and depending on the certifying body that that may or may not be true okay. um there are i would say a growing there's growing attention towards these more sustainable minded kosher and halal uh, businesses. So we're, there's a few online kosher businesses that are kosher and organic. You can order your meat online uh, and they'll ship it to you. It's expensive because of shipping cold yes. meat. Uh, there's in New York, there's a number of, um, <laughs> in New York, there are a number of, new businesses that are doing halal with uh, this sort of regenerative approach. So they're working directly with farmers to make sure that the livestock is being raised in a sustainable way, okay. and then they're selling it directly to consumers. So people are thinking about it, and people are uh, innovating and starting these new businesses, and I think that's exciting because I think that that's, for a lot of people who are looking for this type of food, it is that sort of ethical, spiritual connection. Right. Um, and you want that to go from 
when the animal is born to when it ends up on your plate. Because there are very specific, you know, rules and how animals are slaughtered, both for kosher and halal. And it's, it is very specific in terms of how you treat the animal at their death. And I think it's it's interesting that more people are hoping to see, and you know, one of the sections in, in the report is about animal welfare and how um, there is a push to have more you know the animals treated more humanely. Yeah. So I think it's I think it's 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 interesting to see that it's it's beyond just what the label just the certification of kosher halal. It's the whole practice of raising the animal. Right. And something I thought was just fascinating interviewing, we talked to uh, over 100 people for this report. Okay. So we had great community feedback about uh, their perspectives and opinions on this. And something that just impressed me every time we talked to somebody was how in-depth they understood the process mm-hmm. of killing an animal for yeah. meat. And as somebody who grew up eating meat and trying really hard to not think about that, it is amazing to me that um, that people in... The, the kosher and halal consumer groups are thinking so deeply about these questions, and it really led me to think more deeply about my own relationship to eating meat. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are killing animals to mm-hmm. eat them, and there is an ethical consideration there. And I think we should all probably think a little bit harder about what does that look like, what do we want it to look like, and does that reflect our values? Yeah, I do think it's definitely the attitude – for a lot of people has changed from, you know, just wanting it to be tasty on a plate. And it, it's, there, there is more thought given to how it's raised, how it's treated, how it's fed throughout. And I think if you go to a steakhouse, you, you know, there's the grass fed, there's the corn fed, like they're, they're separated out. So you know, you know, and that impacts the type of meat that you're you're going to eat. So I think, you know, how it's treated impacts a lot more than I think people may want to think about, but probably ought to think about. Yeah. Um, and this, you know, creating these new markets on the consumer side for meat that are a little bit smaller or mid-sized markets mm-hmm. is also a really great opportunity for farmers who may want to diversify and add livestock to their land again. So there's a pretty big movement in the sustainable farming community in Minnesota to bring hooves back on the land, is how they call it. And um, and it's because we're starting to understand more and more that uh, livestock is a really important part of soil health. And so you need oh, to really? have livestock on the land to, to improve your soil. You can uh, retain more rainwater. You can uh, have more uh, of the microbiome all the little insects and Mm -hmm. microbes that live in the soil and you can also sequester carbon uh so it's really important but it can be hard for farmers to make that leap into introducing livestock back into their land if they don't have a dedicated market and the markets as they stand now are really favoring large-scale producers right so what i like about this report is that you know we're not saying go out and start a kosher meat business tomorrow there's you have to do a lot of work. Yeah. It's complicated. It's a lot more than just that. Yes. Um, but there is um, this opportunity to sort of match up these smaller communities in Minnesota um, that are looking for specific products with farmers who are, as I said, it's hard times in farm country right now, looking for new markets and looking to diversify what they're growing. So I think a lot of what this comes down to and our big recommendation out of the report is relationship building. Mm-hmm. So this is all a part of the bigger conversation about the rural urban divide and how do we create resiliency in greater Minnesota and connect that to what's happening here in the metro and our other urban centers. And I think food is a great way to do that. And we can uh, build a lot of cross-cultural relationships through these specialty food products. And I think you mentioned the urban rural divide. And I think, I mean, I'm sure it exists in other states, but I live in this one. So I, I know that it's very real um, between, you know, the seven county metro and, and the rest of the state. It's a very real divide. Yeah, there's a lot of feelings that, you know, the metro gets all the attention, all the money, um, which has varying degrees of accuracy depending on what lens you're using. But agriculture is something that, you know, 
rural Minnesota depends on urban areas as consumers mm -hmm. of their ag products. And the more we can do to knit those two things together, I think the stronger our state will be. Absolutely. Uh, well, Ariel, last couple questions for you. Favorite Jewish holiday? Oh, um, I mean, I actually really love Purim. And okay. this is because I just last year for the first time made my own hamantaschen. And okay. they turned out so well, and I already can't wait to make them again. Do you have a filling of choice that were your favorite? Only poppy seeds. Okay. Yeah. Traditional. I love this. <laughs> love poppy seed also. Uh, and favorite Jewish food? Hamantaschen. Poppy hamantaschen, sure, <laughs> yeah. And now that you've made them your own as opposed to store-bought, I assume. Yes, it's. Um, I have to keep myself from making them all year round. I'll just keep yeah. it special for Purim. <laughs> They're a lot of work, though. So I think that alone tends to push it to just the once a year. Yeah. They're so pretty, and and most of my friends have no idea what they are, so <laughs> it's always an educational opportunity, Absolutely. too. Uh, well, Ariel Kagan, thank you so much. Uh, we will link to this fascinating report on halal and kosher, uh, me, uh, the Minnesota meat market assessment that you helped lead. Uh, we'll have it in the show notes and in the article, uh, but thank you for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Thank you. The Who the Folk podcast is a product of Jew Folk, Inc., if you haven't yet, please subscribe, rate, and review the show. If you have a suggestion of someone who should be on the show, please email me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. Also, go to tcjewfolk.com slash podcast to listen to our new shows, We Won, Let's Eat, the Jewish Food Podcast, and The Jews Are Tired, a weekly recap of Jewish news through an analytical lens. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.